We're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. Uh, we've read the several verses. We're going to read up to the point where we last left off. So we'll start with that. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men, which had the mark of the beast upon them which worship, and upon them which worship his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of, of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, and true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the sun was and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the weight of the kings of the east might be prepared. So this is where we left off. Uh, we did not cover verse 12. Uh, so that's where we're going to continue today. So here, when the sixth angel pours out uh, his vial upon his vial out, the vial is poured out upon the great river Euphrates. Now, the great river Euphrates is mentioned all throughout uh, the Old Testament, beginning uh, in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis. So the great river uh, Euphrates, I think we covered this before when we were looking, uh, studying the book of Revelation, that the great river uh, Euphrates actually represents the eastern boundary of Israel. Uh, it's also, the great river Euphrates is related to Assyria. Uh, I'm not going to put a bunch of uh, references. I put references here, but I didn't cover any of those scriptures. But um, it's related to Assyria, which later became incorporated into Babylon. So Babylon was a kingdom that uh, predated, um, uh, that associated with uh, Babylon and the Babylonian Empire uh, gathered up uh, Assyria. And you kind of get the reference of those in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 29. And also Daniel chapter 2, verse 37 through 38. But uh, what is most notable that uh, when you look at the river Euphrates, what is east of the river Euphrates is Babylon. Uh, and you'll get an understanding of that when you take a look at Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 63 through 64. Uh, and 2 Kings chapter 24, uh, verse 7. It talks about the proximity of Babylon being right on the edge of the Euphrates River. It's one of the the boundaries of the Euphrates, which borders the true boundary of the nation of Israel. So we see that the nation of Israel is really on all sides, uh, bordered by uh, Egypt on one side, and on the other side, bordered by Babylon, right, or um, Persia, right? And so, and those became the enemies of Israel, ready to attack Israel. Right, and then in the north, Syria, Syria, and all those other nations as well. Um, the other mention that we have of the river Euphrates is when the sixth trumpet is uh, is blown, and that judgment is is delivered, and that's when a lot of demons came up out of the river Euphrates that had been bound in the river Euphrates, right? And I think there was a demon that was over them as well that came up, uh, and they thir they killed a third people, a third of the people of the world. So we see that there's something associated with the Euphrates, with the river Euphrates, associated with um, destruction, uh, death, uh, the enemies of God, right? And so that's why we know that a lot of that area over there in the Middle East is filled with a lot of turmoil, a lot of violence, a lot of death, a lot of spiritual fighting naturally and spiritually going on there. Uh, and that's because that is the seat of Satan, All right? So. 
uh, for many people, they don't know that the river Euphrates actually is makes up one of the borders of, of Israel in Genesis chapter 15, verse eight. And wherever Abraham walked, God said that, that land that he would give to them. And he walked all the way up along the borders of the river Euphrates. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse eight, it says, in the same day that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, until thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the river the river Euphrates. So most people don't know what the river of Egypt is, but the river of Egypt is the Nile River. And that other river is the river Euphrates. So that means that the area, we've talked about this before though, but just as a reminder, that means the area of true Israel, right? Goes all the way over here. I put an arrow all the way over on the left. That shows the Nile River. So that's the river of Egypt that they're talking about. And it covers all the way over to the river Euphrates. And so most people don't, oops, most people don't know that, but a lot of the land that has been given to the nation of Israel that uh, Christ is going to reign over when he comes and sets up his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven comes to earth, he's going to reclaim all of the territory that had been promised, that God promised Abraham. And it extends all, the, it extends very far north, all the way up to, um, uh, areas of Turkey and Syria, and it's in very far south into the areas of of uh, Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. So it is very expansive and very extensive, the true area. And Israel, of course, has um, succeeded a lot of that land uh, area uh, to just what we now call modern day Israel, but that is not the area that God had promised Abraham and will give to him. And when Christ comes at his second coming, he's going to reestablish this as being the true borders of Israel. All right, so let's take this off here. Okay. All right. So the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river uh, Euphrates. And it says, and the water thereof was dried up. So the water of the river of the great river Euphrates is, died, is dried up. So that means that uh, there's dry land there. And that's going to, as it says here, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, there are other scriptures that relate to the great river Euphrates. We know the great, the river Euphrates was the cradle, right, of civilization. We all know that. You study that whenever you study uh, world history and stuff like that. Um, but it also is the grave of man's civilization, meaning that um, if you go back and you read uh, a lot of the accounts of, of history, a lot of death has been associated with the river Euphrates, which is not a, a course in, in world history. But if you go back and look at a lot of wars, that river Euphrates was a war that a lot of people got trapped up against and ended up being killed and destroyed because the river Euphrates there was a, a point where even when uh, I said I wasn't going to go into history, what? but even when we did the, uh, the Vars may know about this, we did the Persian Gulf War when all the nations came together or whatever. One of the things that helped us fight, fight when we fought that war is we pushed all the way up and and uh, and able to, to destroy a lot of uh, Saddam Hussein's military and stuff like that because they ended up getting backed up against the River Euphrates things like that. Um, but anyway, Zechariah chapter ten makes mention of the River Euphrates as it relates to Revelation chapter sixteen. It says. And also it had some, some interesting things it mentions about it as well, which I'm dropping this one here because I'm setting this up uh, as a foundation for discussion of the Antichrist, how the Antichrist is going to be an Assyrian. It speaks of this over and over again. But Zechariah chapter 10, verse 11 says, And he shall pass through the sea with affliction, and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the depths of the river shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. So this is a prophecy that's combining both speaking of the Antichrist, but then at the same time speaking of drying up of the deeps of the river. And the drying up of the deeps of the river that we're talking about here is talking about the uh, Euphrates River. And this is talking about how the Antichrist is going to be prepared. The Antichrist is going to be one of the kings of the... Um, he's going to be the king that's going to be responsible for bringing all the kings of the east over to fight against God at the Battle of Armageddon. And so, but when he brings them through across that, that's going to be uh, a battle that's going to bring about affliction and death and suffering and destruction. But it says, shall smite the waves in the sea. That's talking about drying it up. He's going to smite the waves 
uh, he's going to dry up the depths of the river. I was talking about the river Euphrates and says, and the pride of the Assyrian shall be brought down. When he's talking about the depths of the river shall dry up and the pride of the Assyrian shall be brought down, that's talking about how the nations of the east are going to cross the river Euphrates and Christ is going to destroy all the nations that cross over there that surround Jerusalem to destroy uh, that try to fight against God at the Battle of Armageddon. And it says, and the Assyrian shall be brought down. That's a reference to that the Antichrist is going to be Assyrian and God is going to destroy him. So the Antichrist is going to be an, an Assyrian and he's going to be brought down at the day of, of Armageddon. That's when uh, Christ descends and a sword, which is the word of God, descends out of his mouth and he destroys the Antichrist. Right. And that's what he's talking about. And the Syrians shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. Uh, and that's because uh, what the Assyri the scepter of the of the Antichrist is Egypt and sodomy. But his power that he has is going to be a power that he works through sorcery, demonism, uh, you know, incantations, divinations and all those kind of things. So his scepter is going to be a scepter of just witchcraft, you know, uh, you know, all the stuff that we're seeing, all these. Um, uh, demonic individuals that have all these great powers and able to uh, do things with fire and you know and uh, and change the elements of the of the sky and cause snow and you know I don't know what you call them all these superhero stuff like that he's going to be able to do all that stuff and that's like the scepter of Egypt all this uh, power of witchcraft and um, things like that so that's what they talk about the scepter of Egypt shall depart away God is uh, Christ when he is, descends down. From heaven at the battle of armageddon at the end of the tribulation period he's going to destroy uh, the works of the antichrist which are rooted in uh, witchcraft and sorcery and demonism demonic spirits working miracles and stuff like that right uh, another scripture that talks will give reference to what we're reading here in revelation chapter 16 verse 12 as it relates to the river euphrates isaiah chapter 11 verse 15 through 16 it says and the lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the egyptian sea and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry. Now, when many people, when you read that, they're like, I have no idea what they're talking about here. But you see, again, a lot of reference to Egypt again. You see a lot of reference to the smiting of a sea, all right? And then you see another reference of some dry land. These are uh, scriptures that are pointing to the what's going on in Revelation chapter 16 verse 12 about the Euphrates River is drying up. So when it says the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian, again, that's actually a reference to, we know this isn't talking about uh, when the Israelites came out of Egypt um, by the hands of Moses, right? That's not what this is talking about here. When it says he shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian, He's talking about, this is a reference to the Antichrist, just like in the previous verse we read, how the Antichrist is going to have a scepter of Egypt, right? And we know what um, Egypt, what uh, Pharaoh did. He wanted to destroy Israel, uh, destroy the nation, what? keep them in captivity, keep them bonded, and want them to serve their God, of course. Uh, and that's what the Antichrist is going to do, and the same thing as well to Israel. He's going to kill the Israelites. He doesn't want, he's going to go into their temple and declare himself as God. He won't allow anyone else to worship any other God but him. You have to make an image to him worship him and take his mark and all those things, right? He's going to operate from a, uh, a, a power. His power source is going to be from Satan, which Satan, power of Satan represents demonism, witchcraft, sorcery, all those kind of things as well. Uh, and when they say the tongue of the Egyptian sea, he's talking about uh, the, the sea representing the world or all of those in the world that um, don't know God, have rejected God and things like that, that blaspheme God during that time. Right, the Lord shall utterly destroy the, the 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 Egyptian sea. That's talking about how in the last days the world, uh, especially during Revelation chapter sixteen time, where they've all taken the mark of the beast, they're all profaning God, they're all involved in worshiping Satan and demonism and things like that. Uh, he's going to and the the main uh, the chief of all these individuals is the Antichrist. He's gonna he's gonna stop his tongue. He's going to destroy him. And he says, and his mighty wind shall shake the hand over the river. And this mighty hand that he's shaking over the river is a reference to what God did uh, when Moses, um, when God through Moses, able him to part the Red Sea. God used his mighty hand.
hand or the mighty wind to shake the Red Sea open to cause the sea to be dry land. That's exactly what God is. is a, it's it's a symbolic of what God's going to do to the river Euphrates. He's going to shake his hand over over the river Euphrates and he's going to cause the land to be dry. So whatever he's going to do, he's going to move the waters and the waters are going to be moved out of the way. They're going to be dried up, things like that. So he's def, he's going to and it goes on. So he shall smite it in the seven streams. The seven streams, if you go back and you look at, I know we're going more in depth than what many of you guys are like, oh my goodness, he's going on and on. Um, but um, the river Euphrates has, it's, it comes out of the ocean, which I can't remember which ocean it is, uh, Persian Ocean, I'm guessing. Um, Persian Gulf, I'm guessing. Um, it comes out of the Arabian Sea. Uh, it has one uh, one river that starts out in the river phrase, but then begins to open up in, into several mouths and feed several other rivers that feed, that come off the river Euphrates. So when the Lord, he, when he smites river Euphrates, he's going to smite all the tributaries that make up the river Euphrates. So remember, uh, the way rivers flow, they flow from land towards sea. We think of it flowing from the way, I don't know, the way the Bible talks about it. They always talk as if the, the the it flows from the sea flows to the river, but it's not. Rivers flow uh, from the land into the sea. But anyway, but he's going to stop all of those rivers that make up the river Euphrates. He's going to cut all those tributaries off and dry them all up. That's why I talked about uh, shall smite it in the seven streams. So if you go back, I was going to show a big picture of it, but I didn't want to get too too carried away with with showing you all of the different mouths that branch out, that branch out of the river Euphrates, right? Uh, and it says, and make men go over dry shod. So when it says, make men go over dry shod, that's what it means that they're gonna cross over and dry land. And so it, it's a it's, sim, it's symbolic of what God did with Moses when they parted the Red Sea and allowed Israel to come over and dry land. Uh, and so that's, that's what this is talk, talking about here. And it goes on in verse uh, 16 of Isaiah chapter 11, it says, and there shall be, and highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. Like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So this verse here is continuing to talk about that uh, when this river Euphrates is dried up, right? Uh, and of course, when the land is dried up, the enemies, the kings of the east are going to cross over and to, into the land of Israel. And they're going to uh, surround all around uh, Jerusalem, right? Uh, that's setting it up for battleground for the Lord to be able to destroy all the in all of His enemies, all the enemies of God, all the enemies of the saints, all the enemies of of true Israel, right? Uh, and in doing so, He's going to provide a remnant for His people. He's going to destroy all of those that have come against the people of God, come against Israel. And when it's all done, there's going to be a remnant left of the nation of Israel that love God, that, that are the, called the people of God. And it says, which shall be left from Assyria. So Assyria is, this phrase, this word Assyria keeps coming over, uh, coming out over and over as it relates to um, uh, the main principle identified kingdom as associated with leading the attack against the nation of Israel, against the people of Israel, those that love God and serve God. And I keep dropping this in here because um, the the Antichrist is going to be Assyrian as we continue uh, to look at it. And so they're, the, the nation of Assyria, today we will call it um, Turkey um, uh, today, and, and we, we'll do uh, a, a little more uh, research about that as well. All right, so this verse is talking about how the salvation of, of Israel is going to come through the destruction of its enemies. And so God's going to provide a remnant, uh, even though all this destruction is going to happen, he's going to kill all their enemies, there's still going to be a remnant left uh, out, of, out of Israel. All right, so it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. So we talk about the east. It's hard for many people to understand what the e what is east of Israel. So when we talk about east, we're talking about east as it relates to the nation of Israel. We're not talking about east as it relates to uh, how Americans think of what east is. When Americans think of east, we think of uh, we think of those countries that make up China, Japan. That's what that's what we call east. Many people we call east 
Uh, that's what we think of. But when it's talking about East here, it's talking about everything is relative to Israel as the focal point. So east of Israel is Babylon, Syria, Turkey, Iran. Okay, that are, those are those nations that are east of Israel. Now, even when we're talking about the kings of the east, we're not just really talking about those kings as well. Just only only those types of kings, the kings from Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, or Babylon, or Babylon is like Persia, Iran, no, Persia and Iraq, right? It's not really just talking about just those specific nations, because if you continue reading in other scriptures, if you continue reading uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse, hmm, when you look at verse 14 of Revelation chapter 16, it says, uh, for they are spirits of, of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of, of God Almighty. So it talks about gathering the kings to drying up the river Euphrates so that the kings of the east may be prepared to cross over. But that is more of a symbolic meaning of of the type of kings, of what they, the type of kingdom that what we're talking about, but it's actually, it, it's the kings of the whole earth and of the whole world. So when we look at what it talks about here, when it says the kings, when it says the way of the kings of the east, it's talking about the Babylonian spirit. It's talking about uh, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, the whole world, by the time we get to Revelation chapter 16, is going to be Babylon. Right, Babylon. It's all going to be just Babylon. They're all going to have the same type of of kingdom, of right, way of rule, uh, way of living, way of life, way of thought, way of civilization. It's all going to be like Babylon, right? And they're but they're identifying though that they, they that these kings are represented uh, symbolically by certain types of kings, but they're kings that are like the East. And the kings that are like the East that have always been enemies of in, enemies of Israel, enemies of God, are like the enemies that we see in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Syria, like that. Uh, they they hate God, they hate Christ, they hate Christians. They you know I mean, and they are crazy about it, All right? But another way to look at it when it says the kings of the East, when you look at this word East, uh, we've talked about. East, whenever you see this word east, it's always in reference to the sun, right? The way, the direction that the sun rises. That can be both in terms of spiritually meaning speaking, we talked about of Christ, son of righteousness. The sun rises from the east. Christ is going to come from the east, right? When he destroys. Um, but um, as it relates to Babylon, when it talks about the kings of the east, it, it also could be talking about uh, sun worship, Satan worshipers. If you know the foundation of Babylon in the East, right? They worship the sun. Everything is about the sun, uh, the worship of the sun. Uh, the uh, they worship the sun in all its three phases when it rises from when uh, from uh, at sunrise. They worship it when the sun is at its highest point. They worship it when the sun goes down at its lowest point. Right, they they are sun worshippers. So some, this could also be a reference when it says the way of the kings of the east. Right, it could be a reference to all of those nations that are Satan worshippers that have become joined with the worship of Satan. And the whole I've done a lot of things about. Um, I used to do videos about uh, the occult and things like that. If you don't know, the world worships the sun. If you watch a lot of the Olympics when they do their opening scenes and stuff like that, it's all about sun worship. They always like have the sea and stuff like that. And then they have the sun, there's all this sun, kind of sun worship. Uh, if you look at a lot of your symbols that go on, um, uh, symbols that relate to commercial products or things that you buy, it's all based on sun worship. Uh, Walmart has a sun symbol. Coca-Cola has the Coca-Cola with the sun behind it. Um, the Red Bull. Uh, it's an energy drink. It has uh, a sun with two bulls on it. I mean, if I could go through and show you so many symbols that you won't even won't even recognize until I tell you that the world is based on sun worship. Of course, we know that because uh, during the Roman Empire, they made um, uh, they set up the week where 
uh, the day of worship was on Sunday. And they call it Sunday because you worship the sun. That was the day where you worship the sun. But sun worship is the worship of Satan, right? And it's everywhere. I mean, I could, if I showed you, you'd be shocked and surprised how much the sun is represented all throughout a lot of things that we participate in. Um, and and that and it's Helios. Oh, someone is here. Um, sent me a chat here. Let me see if I can. I think it was Richard. Those. Oh, Richard wrote. Those are Cain's children. When he departed from the Lord, he traveled east. All right. So very good. Yes. Uh, oh, thank you for adding that. So yes, Cain's children traveled east, right? And they ended up. Um, becoming sun worshipers or worshiping Satan. And that's where the Tower of Babel came from and all that stuff. And all civilizations, if we travel as much as we, we've traveled and others have traveled, when you go either to, doesn't matter, um, Japan, they have the symbol of the sun. Uh, and lots of nations worship the sun. If you go to uh, China, if you go to Latin America, and they have Aztecs, and they have uh, build these, um, uh, Zigota something you call them, like um, they build these structures that look like pyramids that go up to the sun. If you look on your dollar bill, you'll see the symbol of a pyramid. Right. What's that? Ziggurats. Ziggurats, yes, it's ziggurats. So I'm like, thank you, Lawrence. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much sun worship. So part of this phrase of saying like the way of the kings of the east, it's also really talking about sun worship as well. You know, I may be stretching it a little bit, but I think that that's, that's also a reference to that as well. The kings... Uh, those nations that worship the sun, rising of the sun, things like that. Um, but we also know that the kings of the east do represent those nations that come from the origins of Babylon, right? Whether it be Syria, Turkey, Iran, things like that. And we know that from Matthew chapter 2, verse 12 is the only other reference that I can really come to or that I can really find that gives a reference to about this east. What's this about people coming from the east? And it says, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, it says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. All right, so here we see this phrase, wise men. The original word is, is magi. And magi is a Persian word. And it's Persian because it comes from Babylonia or Babylon during the time of David when Babylon uh, pretty much <laughs> rule the world, All right? And so, of course, uh, they were exposed to the prophecies of Daniel uh, about the Messiah coming and things like that. Uh, and so these magi followed the stars and symbols and things like that. So when this new star appeared, they had already been made aware of that the king was going to come out of Israel. When the Jews were put brought into captivity in Babylon, and there were many Jews there who were prophets and things like that who were in Babylon, uh, and those prophecies uh, were studied by wise men or, or magi, magical men, men of magician and stuff like that, men of astrology and stuff like that. And so those astrologers were astrologers that came from Babylon. So they, uh, to prepare the way of the kings of the East is talking basically about uh, those that are of Babylon, right? Those that were sun worshipers, things like that. Uh, and that's, that's what they're talking about here. And uh, verse two says, saying, where is he that is born of the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So they were aware uh, that Christ was going to be born. And although they were in the east, they were in Babylon. They saw it and they came to worship this new, um, this new king was going to be king of the Jews. And so the east is commonly then known to be, we're talking about Babylon. This was not talking about China or anything like that, or Russia or anything like that. The historical account of what the east represents is the east represents Babylon, right? And all those associated with that Babylon, Assyrian kingdom, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and then all of those who then from out of Babylon became, they birthed many daughters who also continued nations who continued to worship Satan, uh, sun worship, uh, and Satan in the form of sun, sun worship continued to, uh, to continue to, to flourish and grow and new countries and nations uh, were formed that continued, a civilization that continued to worship the sun and Satan as well. All right, verse 13, it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we have three things that are happening that are um, coming out 
of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, right? And it describes them as being unclean spirits, right? So unclean is like sinful, you know, uh, filthy, uh, you know, like anything that's perverse, like full of perversity and, and uncleanliness came out. But when you see the word phrase uh, group with unclean spirits, now what you're basically talking about is you're talking about foul spirits, or foul demons, demons that were foul and unclean and sinful, right? And they were described uh, in physical form to be like frogs. And they came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So typically when we think of frogs, we think of things that are, it represents filth, things that are nasty and disgusting, right? And so that's why the phrase is, is, is it's linked with unclean, spirits like frogs so that so what they're suggesting is that the unclean spirits like frogs are suggesting that the frogs represent those things that are filthy and unclean so basically some kind of unclean filthy um spirit came out of the mouth of the dragon the beast and the false prophet now it says it came out of the mouth so we know when we talk about things coming out of the mouth we know that it's really talking about whatever these unclean things that are coming out of their mouth it's representing, uh, associated with like filthy speech or filthy lies or unclean things that are spoken against God. That's that's kind of what it's suggesting. It's something that's filthy and unclean. Since it's coming out of the mouth of the dragon, coming out of the mouth of the beast, coming out of the mouth of the prophet, everything that they've done, they've ever said, is full of blasphemies against God. That's what they're all known for is blasphemy, saying blasphemy, blasphemy. Uh, blasphemous things about God. So that is basically what these unclean spirits like frogs are doing. They are speaking things that are unclean and unfilthy that are about God, right? When it talks about things coming out of Christ, right, what comes out of Christ, the scripture says, when Christ comes out at the battle of Armageddon, right, it says a sword comes out of his mouth like the word of God. So when uh, the, something comes out of the mouth of, of the Lord, out of Christ, it's his word that's coming out. And, you know, that is clean and that is pure and that is righteous, right? And that is just. But what comes out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet is the complete opposite of that. It's filthiness and it's unclean, right? And it's causing to bring, and it's coming to bring destruction as well, right? Uh, we know that the dragon represents Satan, right? We know the beast represents the Antichrist. And we all know who the prophet is. He rises up uh, from the earth. Uh, and many of us, including myself, believe that that coming up out of the earth being, or the land, uh, earth also is a word that means land. And the, when talk, we speak of land, um, as it relates uh, in the Old Testament, uh, it's speaking of often, it's speaking of Israel uh, in certain contexts as well. So I think that the false prophet arises up out of Israel as well. Um, and he, an unclean spirit, comes out of their mouth as well, speaking things that are lies, uh, that are associated with demonic spirits. So that lets us know then that the beast, the antichrist, or the antichrist, uh, the false prophet, and the we know the dragon, they are all, they are filled with unclean spirits. Filled with the, the antichrist is filled with all kind of demonic spirits. He's filled with demons. Of the false prophet, they are filled with demons. Satan, filled with all kinds of unclean spirits that are that work with him to perform mir miracles and things like that. <laughs> Many of us have gone back and tried to study, like, what do these frogs represent? And at this point, I have not received any additional revelation of, like, why are they shaped like frogs? Only to suggest that maybe frogs represent those things that are slimy, filthy, disgusting, and those things that may be considered unclean. I've gone back and read Exodus chapter 8 you know, over and over again, trying to glean some kind of, you know, I'm praying, you know, but at this point, I really haven't uh, found anything further yet, but I, I know that it will come eventually. But in Revelation, I mean, in Exodus chapter 8, verse 9 through 10, uh, dealing with Moses' uh, plague of the frogs that God called, uh, called him to put upon a judgment, a plague uh, upon Egypt, I'm just going to read just two verses here. It says, and Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? So what happened is, is that Moses put a, brought a plague upon Egypt uh, and a bunch of frogs came up out of everywhere, out of waters, out of ponds, out of rivers, out of everywhere, and just basically went 
everywhere into their food, into their chambers. I mean, frogs were completely everywhere. And then Moses uh, goes back to see Pharaoh and says, will you let my people go? And then Pharaoh says, okay, I will entreat you of the Lord. Ask, uh, ask God uh, to remove the frogs and then I'll consider. If you do that, then I will consider, right? And so this is what we're reading here that Moses and Pharaoh are having this discussion about, okay, can you remove these frogs, get them out of our houses, and only let them remain in the river, right? Uh, and so when I see that the river Euphrates is dried up, and that's how this, this one, this, this sixth plague begins with the drying up the river Euphrates. And then I see how the, in Exodus chapter eight, uh, the, the, the reversal of that process was of getting rid of the frogs was allowing them to go back into the river that I'm wondering, like, hmm, I wonder that the drying up of the river Euphrates is associated with the releasing of those frogs again. I don't know. I'm just kind of just thinking. Because now the river is dried up again, and now these frogs are coming out as well, right? And part of those frogs coming out is just like the, the filth is coming back on the land again, and that's what's going to happen when Babylon, all the kings of the east, representing the filth of, the, of Babylon coming and taking over the land of Egypt. I mean, I'm sorry, the land of Israel, just crossing over the river Euphrates and just coming in and just in, inundating the land of Israel. Is that like what happened uh, to Egypt when the frogs came up out of the river as well and just uh, came out into the land? I don't know. It could maybe that could represent that. The filth, the filth of the nations of the East and the perversions uh, just coming over and just getting into everything and just desecrating everything like that. I don't know, and then God's going to have to destroy it as well. Again, dry it all up and destroy it as well. I don't know. Uh, verse 10 says, and he said, tomorrow, he said, let it be according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. So Moses was telling Pharaoh, I will take away all these frogs. They'll go back into the river and they'll remain there. And when I do that, then you will know that there's no God except uh, the Lord our God. Right, and so maybe this is a process in which Christ is going to prove that there is no God like our God, you know, uh, like Christ uh, and like our Heavenly Father, the true and living God. There's no God like that. Uh, I don't know if this is what's going on here. I don't know if these unclean frogs are coming out and it's causing the nations to be like filthy frogs to come across the river Euphrates and go into the land of, of Israel and pervert and destroy that. And then Christ is going to come and just clean all that up again and show that he is the true um, um, uh, deliverer and king of Israel establish his kingdom. I don't know. That's probably a little bit of a stretch, but I'll continue to read and study up, up on that as well. But as we continue here, it says, these frogs that came out, out of the unclean spirits that came up out of the mouth of the, of, of the dragon, of the antichrist, uh, and of the false prophet, says for verse 14, for they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the king's of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these spirits, these unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon or Satan, the Antichrist and the beast, they perform miracles. And it says, which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world. So um, the dragon working with the Antichrist, working with the false prophet all together they go to all the kings of the earth. So before when we read the scripture, it says that the river Euphrates is dried up, that the kings of the east uh, may cross, may, that the way will be prepared. But now we're seeing that it is basically these, these spirits of devils that come forth from the Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet. They actually go to all the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So that's why I'm saying that uh, the, the, the kings of the earth or the kings of the east is really talking about Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, like spiritual Babylon, those kingdoms that represent the kingdoms of Babylon. And we're talking about um, Babylon, Assyria, Turkey, you know, those nations, you know, which, which hate Israel, hate God, stuff like that, fight against Christianity. They represent um, the hatred toward God, hatred toward Christ, hatred toward Israel. And that spirit is actually in the whole world by the time we get to Revelation chapter 16. And they have all the filth of, of Babylon. The whole world has this whole filth of Babylon right now. And these spirits 
go forth working miracles and they go to all of these kings. And so one of the things that I was kind of looking at this is that I believe that these spirits, the devils that go forth working miracles and says, go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world. That means not just kings themselves, but the spirits that go forth from the dragon, from the antichrist and from the false prophet, they go forth to everyone of the whole world, not just the kings, but they go forth to everyone. Everyone gets deceived. Everyone, these demons work all these miracles that deceive them to think that they can gather to the great day of battle of the Almighty God to try to defeat and overthrow God. And I think what this really is after trying to say is that the devil shares his power, his the devil shares his unclean demonic power along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. These spirits are go forth from them. And they go to everyone in the whole world. They give them uh, power as well. They work miracles, but they give them the sense of that they also have power as well, that they can go and battle against God and against Christ. They come together. They're deceived, but I think they also receive the power. They receive these abilities uh, to be able, like everybody is, when you watch a lot of TV now, everybody wants to have superpowers, you know. Right, I had to correct Leah uh, earlier this week. She's like, my superpowers, and I'm like, you don't have superpowers. No such thing as superpowers. But that's the spirit of the world. It's like everybody wants to have superpowers. Um, and imagine it's like the fantasy of one day everybody gets to have these superpowers, and you're special. And I believe what this is also saying it says, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world. I think Satan, the Antichrist. And the false prophet, who always had all these powers to themselves, have now shared these these spirits have come out from them and gone into the whole world to give them power as well, right? Working miracles with them or through them, uh, deceiving them, thinking that they have some great power that they can go along up with the Antichrist and the and Satan and the false prophet to go up to actually fight against God and think that they can actually beat him and win. Right. And so when it talks about kings of the earth, earth represents, you know, the land or whatever. Uh, when it says the whole world, this phrase, the whole world represents the inhabitable world. That's talking about everybody in the world, you know, that, you know, where men or people live, that these spirits go out there and work miracles with them or to them or through them or bind themselves to them, you know, uh, make them feel like they have superpowers or super abilities or deceive them to mind that they think they have some power that they can go and fight against God. But that's what they basically feel. They have some power that they can feel that they, and when it says miracles, miracles are things that are like um, unnatural, supernatural, um, like that. So they work some unnatural, super supernatural powers that convince these kings and convince everyone in the world that they can fight against God. And I think in order to do that, part of that is that they themselves have been giving some kind of power or ability, been deceived to think they have power abilities, but they're working miracles and stuff through these demons working with them, through them, you know, to gather up together and say, oh yeah, we can, all of us together, we can fight and overthrow God. And I think uh, part of that is what's going on here, you know. And so it says, to gather them together of the great day of God Almighty. So this battle of the of that great day of God Almighty, this is talking about what we call the battle of Armageddon that we, ref, ref, we talked about previously before, what the battle of Armageddon represents. It's a, um, it's a location as well that we talked about, which I'm not going to go back over that again. Now, what throws me off here a little bit, um, what throws me off a little bit that it says in here, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Whenever I read this, I'm just like, that makes, I can't understand why we're talking about Revelation chapter 16, about those who have uh, basically have been cut off altogether from fellowship with God, cast into outer darkness. Uh, they the, uh, the sea has become as the blood of dead men and every living soul has died, talking about that they have been cut off from life. They have no life in them anymore. Uh, the light of Christ has been taken from them. They, the rivers of the waters, the fountains of waters have been have become as blood, right? They've been cut off from the rivers and waters of life of salvation because they've taken away the life that um, that the saints were trying to give to other individuals that they may have the gospel 
share the gospel of that they may receive the water of living, um, the water of life, right? And the filling of the Holy Spirit and that they may receive salvation and stuff like that. Right? All this stuff is going on. And it's talking about those who have basically been condemned and to a place of damnation, eternal damnation and darkness. And then this scripture comes in here, behold, I come as a thief. And I'm like, why, why is this? thrown in here like this you know unclean spirits coming out gathering the kings of the east well uh well unclean spirits coming out to the to 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 the kings of of the earth and uh, of the whole world right to gather them together and then throws in this phrase behold i come as a thief i'm like well i think they've already missed that right but when i look at this here it's a continuation of what we've seen throughout the book of Revelation. We went over that there are seven blessings that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. I'm not going to put them back up again. But the the third of those blessings, the third of the seven blessings in the book of Revelation is what we're looking at here. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So um, I think here that it's a, it's when we look at the, all of the judgments that's coming for those who refuse to re to accept Christ. It's a pause to remind all of us who are reading this, right, um, that we don't want to be found in this kind of situation. We don't want to be deceived to come to a place to be like how these people are, that we've been completely cut off, you know. And it starts with, it starts with this here. It starts with that you weren't watching, you weren't keeping your garments, and now you've, you're naked and other people have seen your shame. And so he's backing off. He's like, these people ended up all the way to this point right here because they would not watch. And it's a warning to us, like, like how do people get this this far down? It's like, because they, some basic simple things that they, uh, they, that, that they did not adhere to. They, they, they did not watch. So blessed if you're watched. But if you don't watch, this, this is your end. This is your end. If you were here during the time of, of the tribulation period or or the you missed the rapture, this it's because you're experiencing all this stuff because of this. You did not watch. You did not keep your garments, you know? And now you 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 you're walking naked and everyone's gonna see see your shame. Right. And so um it says he's coming in the night and darkness. And so uh this is how the people are going to be in the day that that Christ comes, when the day of the tribulation comes. Uh, the great tribulation period comes, it's going to be people who are going to find themselves in the night and, and in darkness. And everything uh, that is valuable and everything that is priceless is going to be taken away. It's going to be gone, you know, taken away from them. They, you know, they're going to not going to have life. They're not going to have um, the water of life. They're not going to have salvation. Everything that is priceless is going to be taken away. You know, going to be gone. It's, it's missed, you know, while you were asleep, you know. The darkness was, is now present and everything that is valuable and priceless has been taken away. And now it's nothing else but just um, just darkness and sin and the Antichrist and unclean spirits and things like that. And you don't want to be a part of that, that process. So uh, he throws out this blessing, this warning. Behold, I come. I come as a thief. So, you know, we don't want to be. Uh, present when the time of the darkness is thieves comes in the time of darkness. So you don't want to be present in the time of the darkness, remaining in the time of the darkness. You want to be gone, you know, uh, when Christ comes. And so uh, he says, blessed is he that watches. So watching is you hear instruction and you keep instruction, right? Um, that you're wise and you don't refuse wisdom and instruction. And that's Proverbs chapter eight, verse 33 through 34. So watching involves hearing, Following instructions, being wise, and refusing it not. Okay, and if you don't do that, you're gonna find yourself as a warning. You're gonna find yourself in this in this state here, Revelation chapter 16. You know, uh, watching also means to give warning. When you read Ezekiel chapter three, verse 17, it talks about watching. Also means you're warning. You don't watch without warning. You're watching so that you can warn. And so reading the book of Revelation, reading these things here is the warning. And this warning is, is instructing us as part of our watching. We read the book of Revelation as part of watching, right? That's part of our watching to check ourselves, to check the times, check the season, things like that. Um, and the book of Revelation gives warning. So watching is a part of, of taking in the warnings, hearing the warnings that are given to us. And so the Lord is speaking to us. In Revelation chapter 16, giving us these warnings that will enable us to watch, right? To be on guard, you know, 
And so um, when you read, when you go back and you reference this thing here, it says, Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. When you really go back and look at the reference in the book of Revelation of what this is talking about, it's a warning that is given to Sardis and Laodicea. If you go back and look at the church at Sardis and look at the church at Laodicea, these are their warnings. So he's actually warning. Oh, Pastor Ballard saying something here. Um, let me see. How did she do this? She did a chat. Oh. Um, Pastor Bell, this is a private, but I'm going to read it. Though. <laughs> uh, uh, Pastor Bell is saying, I believe Jesus is encouraging the church to stand and stay in Christ, seeing what's going on in the church around. Amen. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, let me close this here. All right. How do I get rid of all this other stuff here? Okay. Right. So when you go back, this is actually a reference warning to the church of Sardis and Laodicea. They're the ones that he says weren't watching and weren't keeping their garments. He's the one that warned them that they're going to walk naked and they're going to miss him. And he was the warning to them. They're going to miss the coming. They're going to miss the rapture. These were these two churches. So he's really he's warning. This warning, you know, is a warning to those churches because those are the churches of that were, um, he said, mm. I'm, you go, I'm going to come and I'm going to find you lacking. And so the, uh, these are the worst places. I found your works not perfect. He told them to hold fast. He told them to repent, things like that. And so we're not going to go back and, and study those again because we did that. So, But we did look at these two churches and we saw how not just these churches, but there are going to be several other churches that are not that are going to be present and go through the tribulation period was their warning that these churches are going to go through the tribulation period. Right. So there were a few that were okay, but he says, on large, these churches are going to go through the tribulation period. Church of Sardis, Church of Laodicea, and a couple other churches that, that we looked at. But La Laodicea, he was very firm about these individuals um, being, a, um, being warned that they're going to be caught up in this experience. Right here, we're looking at Revelation chapter 16, and that's very sad. So there are people in churches, right, uh, in the church world that this warning is speaking to directly, that they're gonna be caught up in the same thing right here. And they've already been forewarned about it. He's warning them again that um, don't be that one, <laughs> right? Don't be that one. He says, keep in his garments. And the kid says, keep in his garments, we're talking about uh, keeping to my spiritual garments of salvation. So maintain in Christ, as Pastor Battle was talking about, that we are to stay in Christ. Right. Stay. Keep on our spiritual garments is a warning that there will be people that will not keep their spiritual garments. Right. Uh, we think of this typically as the world. But Christ is now pointing it back to the churches, the, the letters to the seven churches that he warned several churches that you're going to be caught in the situation. He's referencing it back to them. that Yep. These are these people that are caught in that situation. They're going to be those same churches are going to be the same ones that are in the situation right here because they did not keep their spiritual garments of salvation. They did not keep their robe of righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus. They turned away from Christ. They did not hold fast unto Christ and they caught right up in the same situation that he warned them um, uh, in, in chapter three, chapter two, chapter three, that he warned them. And then now he's referencing right here in chapter 16. They're here. In this place right here, that's that's what this is talking about right here. He says they and uh, and they see his shame. So who's the they? He says, "Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame." Who's the they? That they see his shame, right? The they is is those that are the righteous. Those are those that are the saints. Uh, that's God, Christ. You know, the holy angels, right? Uh, we're not supposed those who are in Christ. We're not, our shame is not our we're not our shame is not to be seen, because we are to abide in Christ and be clothed in the garments of salvation. And only those who are in Christ, who are clothed, can see the shame of others that they are not clothed, right? Uh, and so those are the ones that can see the shame of others. But we're, we're not we're not supposed to see 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 their shame. All of us who who are gathered, called together in Christ, right? We're all supposed to be covered together. I'm not supposed to be seeing the, the, uh, your shame. You're not supposed to be seeing uh, my shame. But there are going to be those, right, who know who knew better, who gave who were given a warning, but didn't didn't hear it, right? And Christ came as a thief, 
right? And took everything away that was priceless and valuable and they can't get it back anymore. They've lost it all. And this is a warning to them, to those individuals, to those churches like that. I just focus in on just Sardis and Laodicea. Um, we definitely know about Laodicea as well, um, but it's, it's very sad. All right, so the last thing here. Oh, I guess I'm moving a little slow here. Um, all right. I'll wrap this up quickly. It says, he gathered them together to a place called the, in the tongue, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So uh, the unclean spirits that come out of the mouth of the Antichrist, Satan, uh, and the false prophet, their purpose is to gather the, all the kings of the earth and to gather the whole world. These unclean frogs go, un go forth unto them, seduce them, work with them, give them those powers, whatever abilities that make them think that they can fight against God to gather them together into a place uh, called Armageddon. And that's a place um, in Israel. Um, uh, that's like, I think we said it was like some uh, 16 furlongs long, something like that, which is about 200 miles you know, estimating uh, where they're going to gather together. And then Christ is going to come down from heaven. He's going to destroy all of those that cross over the river Euphrates that come. And actually it's the whole world, but they have a Babylonian spirit, the Babylonian nature and they cross over uh, and they fight against uh, uh, Christ um, in, in Israel. I was gonna read some verses here, but I am not going to read them because of the, of the time. Um, all right, we're gonna pause right here.